Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. We're so delighted to have so many of you in the room with us for our luncheon with Secretary of the Navy, Carlos Del Toro. Our formal program will begin in two minutes, but before we get started, I want to take this opportunity to review some housekeeping items. As you know, we're often carried live on C-SPAN, so now would be an excellent time to silence your mobile devices to minimize any disruption. You'll also find cards at the center of your table. If you have any questions for our speaker today, please write them on the cards and pass them up to the head table, anyone at the head table. I'll, I will ask as many questions as time permits, but I can't ask what I can't read, so please print legibly. Thanks again, and we'll get started in about 60 seconds. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club, the place where news happens. I'm Jen Judson, the 2022 president of the National Press Club and land warfare reporter for Defense News. Thank you for joining us. Both those of you here in the National Press Club's ballroom and to those viewing us online for our headliner event with Secretary of the Navy, Carlos Del Toro. We're happy to accept your questions and after Secretary Del Toro's opening remarks, I'll ask as many as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners at press.org and put Navy in the subject line. It is now my pleasure to introduce this distinguished head table. Starting on my right, we have Ken DeLecky, Navy Vietnam War veteran and former commander of National Press Club's American Legion Post 20. April Langwell, Director of Communication for Headquarters U.S. Marine Corps. Eileen O'Reilly, Managing Editor of Standards and Training at Axios and the President of the National Press Club. Our guest of honor, Secretary of the Navy, Carlos Del Toro. Donna Lionel Leger, Headliners Co-Team Leader and former President of the National Press Club. And to my left, the Honorable John Dalton, 70th Secretary of the Navy. Kevin Wensing, retired U.S. Navy Captain and National Press Club member. Captain J.D. Dorsey, Special Assistant for Public Affairs, U.S. Navy, and Maria Rescio, correspondent for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And Max Letter is not here, I believe, but if he shows up later, there will be Max Letter sitting at the very end from our publisher from Stars and Stripes. Last week, Secretary of the Navy, Carlos Del Toro, tasked his staff with creating a modernization plan for the Navy that looks 30 years into the future, selling short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals for building an agile and ready naval force. He told the audience at West 2023, the Sea Services Conference in San Diego, that it was time for the Navy to get real about the challenges the Navy and the nation face. Indeed, much of the Navy's infrastructure has reached, has reached its dotage from 115-year-old dry docks to the crumbling 40-year-old Bethesda barracks. In January, the Navy closed four submarine dry docks in Washington State after experts found the docks are vulnerable to earthquakes. The four out-of-commission dry docks are at least 40 years old. This new plan is in addition to a shipyard infrastructure optimization plan already underway to overhaul the Navy's four shipyards. Secretary Del Toro, who is responsible for more than 900,000 sailors, Marines, reservists, and civilian personnel, and an annual budget exceeding $210 billion, has said that maintaining maritime dominance, strengthening the Navy's posture as a sea-based strategic deterrent, developing a warfighting culture of excellence, and building strategic partnerships are among his top priorities. He has identified China's naval ambitions and climate instability as key strategic concerns. Our global economy and the self-determination of free nations everywhere, especially in the Indo-Pacific, depends on sea power, he said, during the October release of his strategic guidance, 
We're eager to hear more from Secretary Del Toro, U.S. Naval Academy graduate who spent 22 years in the Navy, rising to the rank of commander before founding the private sector company SBG Technology Solutions. Please join me in giving a warm National Press Club welcome to Secretary of the Navy, Carlos Del Toro. Well, thank you, Jen, and congratulations, Eileen. I wish you both a peaceful transition to, of power here at the National Press Club. I hope it goes uneventful. It's great to be with you all. And Ms. Riley, thanks for that kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me here today. It's important to have these conversations, and, and this is a venue like no other venue. This building could be called the National Headquarters of Free Speech, and it's an honor, a real honor, to have this opportunity to address the press in our nation. And I want to start with a sincere thanks to all the members of the press themselves. In fact, I'd like to ask all the members of the media and press to please stand and be recognized just for a moment. Would you please do that for me? Many of them are watching online. <laughs> and to many of you watching online, you can now see it. But you, ladies and gentlemen, represent one of the foundational principles which our nation has built, the freedom of expression. The very first amendment to our Constitution, which all service members and civil servants, including myself, swear to protect and defend, establishes the right to freedom of press, freedom of speech. You are an absolutely critical element to any free society, any democracy. And you don't always get credit for that or the respect that your profession deserves. And I'm not saying this in the hopes that you'll go easy on me at Q&A time. I know you'll, 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 you'll do your job to the best of your ability, just as I do mine. And it may seem odd or unnecessary to make such a point of this, but we have seen threats to our democracy, to our very institutions in recent years. So I believe it's important to be very explicit in stating my beliefs. The media, the free press, are absolutely essential to our democracy in informing its citizens and holding its leaders accountable. And of course, I know this better than most since I was born in Cuba, a communist and autocratic nation like Russia and China, where members of the press are more often than not persecuted. So thank you for what you do. Now, I hope that everybody had a good President's Day. It's a holiday that I cherish. And each year, I try to take some time to reflect on and learn a bit more about the courageous and visionary leaders who established the democratic traditions of our nation. And there is no individual in history whom I find more fascinating or for whom I have greater regard than George Washington. Now, there are some things about George Washington that every American knows. He was our nation's first president. He was a soldier. He was a general. We also know that he was in no way a perfect person, the chief example of this being the fact that he was a slave owner. Despite these very real faults in his day, he was such an inspiring and influential leader that he could have been president for life had he chosen to do so. Yet he was humble, he was unpretentious, and above all, he believed in our American values of freedom, self-determination, and democracy. But what Americans do not fully appreciate is that though he was the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, he was also our first naval strategist, making the most of our French allies' ships to defeat the British at Yorktown and achieve our very independence. In November 1781, in a letter to his friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, he declared that the advantages of a navy to America and the honor and glory of it to the allied arms in these states must depend absolutely upon the naval force which is employed in these seas. And that, as certain as that night succeeds today, that without a decisive naval force, we can do nothing definitive and with it everything honorable and glorious. In short, President Washington understood that America is indeed a maritime nation. From the beginning, we knew the survival of the nation and its economic prosperity, in fact, its economic viability, depended on a navy that could secure the nation's trade and defend its sovereignty on the seas against predatory, established powers and pirates alike. Much has changed since the founding of our nation, but some things remain as true today as they were two and a half centuries ago. And in fact, the importance of naval power event predates our nation itself. From the ancient empires of the Mediterranean to today, 
The ability to project power and protect trade routes at sea has been a defining characteristic of the world's most influential nations. The United States emerged from World War II as a dominant naval power, and since then has underwritten the laws and rules that govern the oceans. For example, ensuring the acts of piracy are the exception rather than the rule, as was the case in the past. It is thanks to our presence in international water that commerce has boomed in the last half century all over the world. And with those increased levels of trade have come improved economic prospects, higher standards of living, and greater opportunities for greater numbers of people, not just in the United States, but in all nations that participate in free and open trade. Ladies and gentlemen, the US Navy has guaranteed this freedom by ensuring the stability and security of sea lanes around the world. Let me say that again. The US Navy has guaranteed this freedom by ensuring the stability and security of sea lanes around the world, particularly in areas where piracy, terrorism, and other forms of illegal activity threaten the safe passage of goods and people. Ocean shipping is an integral part of the supply chain for most industries, making it a backbone of global trade. <clears throat> it is a vital component of sea commerce. More than 50,000 merchant ships move approximately 90% of the world's cargo each year, a crucial component of international trade. And yes, that means that 90% of what Americans order online or purchase in stores, unless it's made in the US, gets to them by sea. It's worth taking a moment to reflect on that. What would we do? How well would we get by if we could no longer rely on 90% of our international imports? The stability, the dependability of our maritime commerce are only possible thanks to the day-to-day -day activities of US sailors and Marines who provide a visible and active presence at sea. US naval forces are an incredibly effective deterrent to would-be aggressors. In short, the might of the US Navy over the course of the last 70 years has made it possible for a true revolution in the way human beings live on this planet. And not just one revolution, but two. I'm talking about the incredible shift in the way we communicate, especially since the advent of the internet. The first transatlantic cable dates back to 1858. Though this sounds like ancient technology, undersea cables continue to be a huge component of our modern world, connecting people, businesses, and governments around the globe. These cables, which are laid on the ocean floor, enable the transmission of vast amounts of data at high speeds across vast distances and are an essential component of the global communications network. In fact, over 99% of all international data is transmitted via undersea cables. And the need for undersea cables will only grow as more devices become connected to the internet and as data intensive applications become more prevalent. Yet, undersea cables are vulnerable to damage from a range of natural and human made causes, including earthquakes, tsunamis, fishing trawlers, and even intentional damage. The US Navy plays a crucial role in protecting undersea cables. Our ability to monitor and secure these cables is just one of the many ways that America and indeed the entire planet depends on us, sometimes without even realizing it. So next time you come home to find that Amazon box by your door, whether you want it or not, next time you check Facebook or read an email, thank a sailor, thank a Marine. Better yet, help us recruit future sailors and Marines to perform that critical mission. Though we have maintained and upheld sea lanes and international rules and norms for over half a century, there is no guarantee that this will continue unless we are deliberate in our efforts to do so and make the necessary investments today. That is because we are being challenged by actors who seek to disrupt the world order. It is no secret that the People's Republic of China seeks to append our dominance on the oceans across the globe. The People's Liberation Army Navy has added over 100 combatants to its fleet, a naval buildup that is a key component of its increasingly aggressive military posture globally. Today they have approximately 340 ships and are moving towards a fleet of 440 ships by 2030. What's more, as stated in our national security strategy, the PRC has both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to advance that objective. China's disregard for the rules-based international order is particularly troubling in the maritime domain, from the Taiwan Straits to the high seas. 
The values espoused by the Chinese Communist Party are incompatible with individual liberty, with democracy, and with respect for human rights. This is about the future of humanity and our planet. We cannot allow the current free and open international system to be overturned. I don't want that for my granddaughters. I don't want it for any Americans or for anybody from any corner of the globe. God forbid we should one day have to say, if only we had done more. We must stand strong in the face of totalitarian regimes today. We must ensure our forces are ready. We must expand and deepen our partnerships and our alliances across the globe. And we are certainly not alone in our efforts to maintain the order and stability of our international system. Almost every other nation has as much, if not more, to lose if the current world order were to falter. We need our partners and our allies, just as they need us, and we are all stronger together. China is not the only challenge to a lawful and orderly international system. On the one-year anniversary this week of Putin's unconscionable invasion of Ukraine, Russia's army has resumed its offensive across much of the theater. We have watched in horror the images of cities bombed and civilians targeted. And we've watched in admiration the steadfast resilience of the Ukrainian people. But we've done more than just watch. At, every, at the very highest levels of our government, we have seen a commitment to the Ukrainian people. Over the weekend, while Vice President Biden visited, excuse me, while President Biden visited Kiev, Vice President Harris declared Putin is committing crimes against humanity in his invasion of Ukraine. In 2022, the Biden administration has directed nearly $50 billion and assistance to Ukraine. As part of that, the Department of the Navy coordinated the identification, adjudication, and delivery of critical systems, weapons platforms, munitions, and support equipment to address critical Ukrainian needs. Our forward presence in the Mediterranean, first the Harry S. Truman Carrier Strike Group, and now the George H.W. Bush Carrier Strike Group, serve as a regional reminder of our tremendous military might. Let me be very clear. As stated by the President and the Secretary of Defense, we will continue to support our partners in Ukraine, and I have full trust in our ability to ramp up production, just as we have in the past. The defense industrial base has never let the American people down, and I don't believe it's about to start now. Moscow has not abated its efforts to impose its dominion over other large swaths of the Black, Baltic, and Arctic seas, and attempts to intimidate other countries and prevent them from exercising their rights to free passage. That is why six of seven of NATO's priority operating regions are maritime focused, driving adoption of its first maritime strategy. I hope I have convinced you of the absolute necessity, today more than ever, of the United States of America maintaining a Navy that is powerful enough to prevail against any challengers. I want to be very clear on this topic as well. Only a few weeks ago, it's fair to say that most Americans were not sufficiently aware of the threat posed by the PRC. Because of the incursion of a Chinese balloon into our airspace, most Americans' alarm bells have now gone off. Americans are rightly alarmed that a PRC balloon violated our sovereign airspace. What Americans should also know is that the PRC consistently attempts to violate the maritime sovereignty and economic well-being of other nations, including our allies and trading partners in the South China Sea and elsewhere. Your Navy, your United States Navy and Marine Corps, is helping our allies and partners stand up to PRC coercion in their exclusive economic zones. We must as a nation continue to adopt a balanced, rational approach to the enduring challenges that we face. I have great faith in our president and our national leaders' abilities to find peaceful solutions to the enduring challenges that we do face. I also give credit to the many Department of Defense personnel and State Department foreign service officers diligently working overseas. They are continuously engaging in dialogue, negotiations, and meetings with our partners and our allies, as well as with other potential adversaries to find solutions that involve no loss of life, no sacrifice of our precious sons and daughters. But we must always be prepared for any contingency that our Navy may face, and our Navy Marine Corps team needs to always be prepared. Since taking office in August of 2021, I can proudly say that the Commandant, the Chief of Naval Operations, and I have worked together to ensure that our Navy and Marine Corps remains the most capable and lethal maritime force in the world. Last June, our shipbuilders laid the keel for the first of a new Columbia class of nuclear ballistic submarine that will underwrite 
the nation's nuclear deterrent all the way out to the year 2080. And the second Columbia-class ship, the USS Wisconsin, has begun pre-construction activities as well. Marine aviation continues to build capability and capacity in the image of the future force. Just over a month ago, we reactivated Marine Aerial Refueler Transport Squadron 153. This squadron provides both fixed wing and rotary wing aerial refueling capabilities and will significantly increase the reach and sustainment capabilities of Marines in the Pacific theater. And the Operational Test and Evaluation Squadron, VMX-1, continues to push the boundaries of heavy lift operations. Just last month, they successfully lifted an F-35C strike fighter. That is a significant capability, especially when it comes to aircraft and personnel recovery missions. Last month, the Marine Corps, in close coordination with our Japanese allies, activated a base in Guam, paving the way for 5,000 Marines to have a permanent presence in the second island chain to counter Chinese aggression. We are also making great progress on the unmanned aircraft front. Early in my tenure, we established a new first-of-its-kind task force in the Middle East at our naval base in Bahrain called Task Force 59. Task Force 59 is rapidly integrating unmanned systems and artificial intelligence into maritime operations in the Fifth Fleet area of operations. And we will soon expand that capability to other regions of the world as well. We are making investments in our next generation of guided missile destroyers, the DDGX program, as well as the next generation air dominance aircraft, or NJAD, which will eventually replace our Super Hornets, and finally, the SSNX, our next generation of nuclear attack submarines. Another area of continued investment is in the shipyard infrastructure optimization program known as PSYOP, modernizing our four aging public shipyards, as was previously mentioned, by optimizing facilities and infrastructure, as well as increasing dry dock capacity and capabilities. If there's one thing I hope Americans take away from what I've said today is this. Sailors and Marines are working hard every day on your behalf to maintain our freedom and our way of life. What they do may not always be visible to us every day, but it is critical to every aspect of your lives. Be protective of your Navy and Marine Corps. Be proud of them. We are strong. We are moving with urgency. And what we need most is your support, the support of the American people and the support of our allies and partners. We are an all-volunteer force. We have been for 50 years. We need the continued support of the American people as much as we ever have. We, in fact, are the American people. We need your support through your elected leaders. We need your support through your words. And we need your support through your actions. We need your talent. We need your ideas. We need your enthusiasm. Perhaps most of all, we need your continued faith in American values. We need Americans from every sector of society, of every race and ethnicity, of every religious belief, every sexual orientation and gender identity. Everyone is welcome in our Department of the Navy. What matters most is the American people's willingness to do their part in the greatest experiment humankind has ever embarked upon, a nation formed on an idea, on a hope, a nation in constant dialogue about what is getting right, what needs to be fixed, and continuous struggle to correct course, to be better than it was yesterday for all the citizens and for all the world. And finally, in closing, I wish to extend our collective thanks to President Jimmy Carter, who has led an extraordinary life, a life of service admired around the world. That service began 80 years ago as a midshipman at the U.S. Naval Academy. Last Friday, I had the honor to name a building at the Academy in his honor. He is now standing his final watch. We wish him fair winds and following seas on the next phase of his great journey. May God bless Jimmy, Rosalind, the entire Carter family. And now, I'll take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Is this on? All right, excellent. Uh, I wanted to start off with a very easy question. Uh, please discuss the challenges facing recruiting. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Look, inevitably, throughout our nation's history, any time that the economy has actually been strong, and certainly despite the obvious uh, negative impact of inflation, and inflation now is going down, uh, when unemployment is as low as it is, it's always historically made it very difficult to be able to recruit members into our armed service. That's point number one. 
Uh, there also has been a challenge over the course of the last five years or so in terms of the propensity of uh, young men and women to join the service, and that has become another challenge, sometimes brought on, in my humble opinion, by the bashing that's taken place over the last six years, you might argue, about service and government, service and uniform. We have rarely seen this throughout our nation's history, despite a Republican administration being in power or, or a Democratic administration being in power. As Americans, we've always come together to support our uniform members, to support the admirals and the generals across our nation's military services. It's also, it's important for Americans to all come together at this moment in time to support those in uniform. The third uh, challenge that I think we have faced from a recruiting perspective is obviously COVID. COVID has locked down our schools. It's been very difficult for young men and women to be able to even participate in the extracurricular activities they, they once were able to participate in freely. And so it's made access to those schools difficult as well too. But I'm very hopeful that we're gonna overcome these challenges all working together, and we're gonna get back to where we were before. I'll share a bit of good news, however, is that we're retaining more Marines and sailors now than we ever have as well. And that's a result of, yes, it's very true. And so that's a positive sign too that I think we're doing the right things by our sailors and Marines and getting back to where we should be. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, the U.S. and our allies have been supplying many high-tech weapon systems to Ukraine as they defend themselves against Russia's brutal invasion. Are we dangerously depleting our stockpiles of vital weapons that the Marine Corps and other services need? I don't think we're dangerously depleting them. We're obviously keeping a track on all our supplies, and most importantly, actually, at the Office of the Secretary of Defense level, both Kath Hicks and the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, Bill LaPlante, have been working very, very closely with industry to try to get up the production rates for all, our, all these critical munitions that are necessary uh, for both the, the fight in Ukraine and, and to be able to deter China and do other things that our nation needs to do as well. And so those investments are now just starting to kick in place, I think. And uh, you know, one thing that Congress could do, obviously, is to uh, pass bills on time so that we don't have to go into continuing resolutions so that we could actually make the necessary investments that are needed to get those supply stocks up. So I'm hopeful that this year we'll actually be able to pass a bill and not go into continuing resolution again. And I think all those efforts will help collectively to get us back to where we need to be. Okay, uh, related to this, mm -hmm. uh, in January, a handful of Navy leaders discussed late deliveries of weapons and industrial base capacity concerns. Uh, what's happened since then? Has the Navy been able to talk to any of the contractors involved to help identify solutions or worked with OSD to help increase industry's capacity to build missiles and weapons? I would argue all three of our civil secretaries working with OSD staff have been engaging very significantly with industry. It's important. You know, often when people ask me what's the key to success to any organization, I say it's teamwork. And so the communications that we actually have with our industrial workforce, all the different companies, small, medium, and large companies out there that are trying to make a difference with us, that communication is really important. And we've elevated that to a new high, in fact, so that we can understand each other's challenges, uh, both in industry and also in government, to try to get to a better place and try to get these production rates up to where they need to be. At the same time, we've also made major investments. Uh, the fiscal year 23 um, budget actually invested approximately $2.5 billion in the industrial base for nuclear submarines, for example, to try to get those production rates up. And we will continue to do this in an effective way so that we can get to a better place. Okay, and, and to follow up, uh, what industrial base gaps do you see for the Navy systems? Are there any, is there any specific component or certain missiles or, or any other weapon systems that so are more effective course, than others? Absolutely. Over the course of the last 10 years, we've seen a shrinkage of the, of the, of the, of the marketplace, basically. So now on some of our platforms, for example, there are certain valves or materials that are hard to get to because the companies that would normally manufacture those have either disappeared or there's less of them, right? So we need to continue to work together to try to expand that marketplace so that we can have even greater competition to get to the parts that we actually need. All right. Um, this is a question from my colleague, Megan Eckstein at Defense News. Uh, we're expecting an announcement in March on AUKUS and its path forward, and I've got uh, about five questions following <laughs> this uh, statement. Whatever the final decision may be, on, whatever the final decision may be on the future Australian submarine design, what are your hopes for AUKUS? Can it help the struggling U.S. submarine industrial base in some way? Will it allow greater access to ports and repair yards in Australia? 
and what benefits will come from sharing other top-tier military technologies with the UK and Australia? Yes to all those questions. Next <laughs> right. question. Right. I no, can repeat very... <laughs> one at a time, too, if you need that. <laughs> I'm very, very excited by the, the prospects that AUKUS brings to the national security of uh, Australia, the UK, and the United States. I think it's an extraordinary opportunity for three very close allies to work together to expand our industrial base when it comes to submarine construction, repair, uh, maintenance, sustainment, operations. And so I'm very much looking forward to uh, announcements that will come out in the White House sometime in the March timeframe. Um, and I think it's going to put uh, all three of our nations in a far better place with regards to our strategic advantage of being able to work together and deter our adversaries in the future. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Poonam Sharma, editor of Global Stratview. The chair of the UK's Defense Committee recently suggested that India and Japan should be invited to join AUKUS. What are your views on that? Well, I think we have to get through this phase of AUKUS first and before we consider any other future expansion of AUKUS itself. There's a lot of work that still remains to be done, and I think we're working very aggressively with that, and we'll soon see announcements coming out of the White House and, and the other two nations with regards to how we're going to proceed in the near future. Okay, and to follow up on a related question, what are your priorities in the Indian Ocean region, particularly with regard to cooperation with the Indian Navy? Cooperation with the Indian Navy is very, very important. India is an extremely important strategic partner to us. We've had a long history of very close relationships. I myself went out as Secretary of the Navy to India just this past November to have uh, discussions with uh, the Indian Navy. And to, in terms of the strategic advantage that we could bring having both our navies working together in the Indian Ocean, for example, and trying to establish a strategic framework from which we can then bring certain technologies to bear to give us the strategic advantage that we need. But I'm really enthused and I'm really hopeful that uh, this strong relationship will continue uh, as time goes by um, and we can work even closer together than we have in the past. Okay. What does the Navy intend to do about a shipbuilding plan and where is the Navy in conducting its amphibious requirements study? Sure. So we completed our first phase of the amphibious uh, requirement study. Uh, we submitted that to Congress. It's a classified report, so I can't talk about it openly. Uh, as far as our shipbuilding plan, we continue to evolve our shipbuilding plan so we can submit it as well, too, uh, as we submit the uh, presidential, presidential budget uh, for fiscal year 24 as well. And, um, and then we also have a uh, BIFSAR, which is a Battle Force uh, Strategic Assessment uh, Requirement Study that's ongoing that hopefully we'll complete by the end of the year as well. That'll take a look at all the requirements, both amphibious and ship of the line requirements as well too, and come up with the best mix and match of all the capabilities that we need to make our Navy even stronger. Late last year, you said in a speech, the intense repair and revive demands of high-end conflict in Asia will require significant shipyard capacity in the Pacific. You've sent an auxiliary ship to a repair yard in India, but beyond that, what more are you considering when it comes to allowing foreign ports to work on U.S. Navy ships and overall increasing wartime repair capacity in the Pacific? That's a great question, and obviously the ability of the United States Navy to be able to do uh, Forward-based repair and maintenance is critical to us. It's part of why we're actually proceeding down the AUKUS path as well, too, with regards to submarine capability in the future. Um, and the, the one ship, the MSC ship that we did send to India, for example, was a perfect example of how well executed we can do this mission. And we're also looking at other opportunities throughout Asia as well, too, where we might be able to do that as well, too, perhaps in the Philippines and Singapore and other places like that. You've talked about the confluence of the shipbuilding industrial base struggling to recruit new shipbuilders and the need for more legal immigration. Can you expand on how the Navy may be working with the rest of the Biden administration to understand the shortage of people interested in trades such as welding, pipe fitting, and other skilled crafts and what the whole of government can do to get after this issue? No, look, I, I applaud our president and I applaud uh, you know, uh, our cabinet, in fact, for addressing this as a whole government type of challenge. We have to work with the Congress, for example, to come up with increased legal immigration so that we could actually provide the blue collar workforce that's necessary in this country. Again, when you have unemployment at you know less than 4%, it makes it a real challenge regardless of whether you're trying to find workers for a restaurant or you're trying to find workers for, for a shipyard. And all of you probably have experienced this throughout the economy in one form or another. And so it's important uh, to be able to, in my opinion, this is a little bit out of my swim lane, but I've had these discussions with other members in, in government about, you know, 
increased, uh, more aggressive work visa programs where we can bring in skilled labor from other countries where they might not have work, as well as increased legal immigration as well, too, to supplement. It's been the, the way we've always done business in this country since its, since its founding. And, but when, when we're challenged with that labor market, that really is a problem, and that leads to some of the challenges that we see today, where we were simply trying to rob from Peter to pay Paul, and everybody's sort of sharing, the, trying to you know, recruit from that same labor pool. Okay. Uh, the Chinese are outpacing the U.S. in shipbuilding. While U.S. ships are seen as more capable, what's the strategic implication of facing a larger Chinese fleet? It's significant. You know, every day, myself, the Chief of Naval Operations, and the Commandant of the Marine Corps, we wake up, uh, not together, but we wake up in, in our different households, and uh, we wake up and we think about how is it that today I'm going to face this challenge of readiness today to be able to meet any challenge that we may face today or tomorrow, right? The need to modernize our Navy and our Marine Corps and the capacity that we also feel we need to be able to counter the threat. And it's a real challenge, but capacity does matter. And so therefore we do need a larger Navy. We do need more ships in the future, more modern ships in the future in particular that can meet that threat. Unfortunately, China does have a significant advantage. Obviously, they're a communist country. They don't have rules by which they abide by. I don't necessarily consider that an advantage, but it is a reality, which means they have 13 shipyards. In some cases, their shipyard has more capacity. One shipyard has more capacity than all of our shipyards combined. That presents a real threat, combined with the fact that they, have, they use slave labor in building their ships, right? Uh, that's not the way we should do business ever, but that's what we're up against, and so it does present a significant advantage. The advantage that we have, however, is our people, our people, you know. Um, in many ways, our shipbuilders are better shipbuilders. That's why we have a more modern, more capable, more lethal Navy than they do. And we, you know, they script their people to fight. We actually train our people to think. There's a fundamental difference in how we train our Marines and our sailors and our soldiers and our airmen and our space force in this country that gives us an inherent advantage over anything that the Chinese can put up against. Okay, so what does the U.S. need to compete with a rapidly growing and capable Chinese Navy? What do, what do we what need do to need? compete with them? Yeah. Well, I think we need to continue to invest in R&D and science and technology in a significant way in professional military education in every significant way as well, too. It's not just about the technology. It's about the strategy that we employ. I often tell, you know, I have approximately uh, 200 admirals, 80 generals. I expect all of them to know how to fight, but what I want them to do is to think strategically how to deter war and if called upon to conflict, to be able to win those conflicts, right? So it's the combination of technology and operations and knowing how to um, maneuver and fight, fight the wars and the strategy that goes into that as well, too. We need all of that collectively. Uh, China is being more aggressive in the Pacific and even the skies over America with their spy balloon, as you highlighted in your speech earlier. Uh, how should the Navy respond to China's activities? Um, and to follow up, what can the U.S. Navy do to intercept intelligence gathering balloons and other threats operating in high altitudes before they threaten the homeland? Well, I think we need to do exactly what the president called us, uh, the military, to do, is to shoot them down when they present a real threat and to try to understand exactly uh, you know, what they are and to shoot them down at the right moment in time, such as off the Atlantic coast, so that it could actually fall in, in U.S. territorial waters so that we could easily find it and recover it as well, too. So I applaud uh, you know, the president. I applaud the, the entire military for working together to recover that balloon. And can you just highlight a little bit more in terms of how you are seeing the Chinese uh, grow in their aggression in the Pacific? And, you know, you know, obviously the, sure. the balloon is something that the United States noticed, but you're seeing things all the time. So. Oh, of course. Yeah. And look, they've, they've put more satellites up in the air than they have in the past decade as well, too, which is a significant threat. That's why we as a nation have to continue to make investments in cybersecurity and space technology, all of us working together in a joint manner. Um, they've got a larger fleet now, and so they're deploying that fleet globally to places across the globe as well, too, uh, trying to find strategic bases around the globe that they could invest in so that they can actually get access to. And so those are all the challenges that we have to find ways to work together. And, and what I will say is that our unique advantage is, is that we work together with our allies and partners from around the world. They don't have many friends. They don't. We do. And that's the real advantage that we have that they don't have. Okay. This question comes from uh, Jeff Zazulowitz of Navy Times. Uh, the Navy's been undertaking a years-long HR transformation effort that is upgrading and modernizing its web of ancient IT systems. 
that handle pay and personnel records. But the effort hasn't gone to plan, and thousands of sailors have seen their pay, benefits, and DD-214 discharge paperwork disrupted in recent years. What do you make of this, and do you feel that this HR transformation is on the right course? Well, what I, the takeaway that I, that I take from it, actually, is that any time that you institute a very large uh, enterprise-wide IT um, transformation, you should really take the time to pilot it out correctly, right? To make sure that it functions well, perhaps with a smaller number of units before you go enterprise-wide. But those decisions were made long before I got here. And so for me, it's important to do, bring all the resources that I can together to try to fix the problem as we're now trying to integrate all of these enterprise-wide. So when I was in the Navy, you had basically a PSD, a personal support detachment, that you went to you know, once a month and you told the little lady behind the PSD all your problems and she'd fix them online and it might take a little bit longer, but she knew who she was, right? But well, we moved away from that to an enterprise model basically where we have these centers that are now working 24-7 around the globe, and that's a good thing. But, you know, you're putting in a call ticket, basically, that doesn't go to that nice person that you knew before, so you've lost a personal touch. So we've got to overcome these challenges from an IT perspective, and I applaud the Navy in particular, for example, for overcoming the DD-214 problem that we had. Within a matter of actually two to three months, we were actually able to bring those numbers back down to a controllable level, so. There have been some deaths and severe injuries in SEAL training in the last couple of years. Is there an issue of operational fatigue or is there a problem in the intense culture of the special warfare community? And what is being done to address safety and sustainability of the personnel in this elite force? Well, at any given time, I'm, I'm myself and the Chief of Naval Operations, the Commandant, and operational commanders are always worried about operational fatigue. But uh, there's no excuse, quite frankly, or hardly any excuse for the loss of life during times of peace and training. And we do understand that accidents sometimes do happen, but they should be, unavo uh, they should be avoidable. And so it's important to better understand how we train uh, and have better processes in place to monitor uh, our sailors and our soldiers when they are training, whether it's in a SEAL-type environment or whether it's at sea or an amphibious landing or anything like that. And I would argue that over the course of the last at least year and a half that I've been here, we've played a lot of priority into ensuring that we're actually caring for our sailors and our, and, our, and our Marines when they're training at their hardest. And so we're paying close attention to the procedures that we follow to ensure that we have no loss of life during peacetime. All right. What impact will the accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO have on military operations in the Arctic? A lot. Next question. <laughs> Please elaborate. <laughs> I think it's extraordinary. I mean, I really look forward and I hope that we can get through all the diplomatic issues that we've been having, obviously, with their um, integration into NATO. But, um, you know, Norway, Finland, Sweden, the, you know, the United States, we're all nations that we've been working, we have a history of working together uh, for quite some time now. And so to have both those nations join NATO formally will allow us to do even more so in the future, and it's very, very exciting. Okay. Enhanced U.S. access to bases in the Philippines was recently announced. Should there be NATO-like alliances in Asia to balance the aggressive and threatening nature of communist China? I, I don't think that that's necessarily, uh, it's necessary right now in the formal sense. We have a lot of really strong partners, uh, partnerships with our allies in, in Asia, across Asia, whether it be, if you look at AUKUS, for example, if, if you look at the relationship between India and the United States and, and Japan and South Korea. And I think that those relationships and lead to uh, the types of complex operations that are necessary for all of our navies and Marine Corps and, and other services to work together to become more interoperable and interexchangeable as well too. I think there's a long history of that approach that I think can continue to really prove worthwhile and beneficial to all our collective security together. Rebuilding U.S. nuclear forces is an increasingly urgent priority. The U.S. Navy's submarine leg of the nuclear triad deterrent is the most survivable, but is aging out. How has inflation and supply chain issues affected the Columbia submarine program? Well, let me first thank the American people, quite frankly, for the major investment that they've made in our Navy and our submarine force. 
Uh, these decisions were made well before I came along, obviously, but the decision to actually build the Columbia class itself, which has been going on for decades now, is a, it's a huge investment in our nation's nuclear triad, which will pay dividends in the 20s and 30s and 40s all the way out to 2080, obviously. Uh, we have to make sure that that class of ship stays on time, on target, on budget, so that as the Ohio class submarines um, decommission, there's no gap between the two, and we're looking at uh, each Ohio submarine hull as well, too, to see which ones we can extend to make sure that there's even less chance of a gap between the two. So thank you to the American people for what's an enormous investment in our submarine force. Okay. Uh, bouncing around a little bit, can you provide an update on the challenges of sexual assaults in the military? Do LGBTQ sailors face the same dangers of sexual harassment and abuse as women in the Navy have faced for decades? How are you addressing that challenge? Well, we're addressing it with an all-hands-on-deck type of approach. Uh, you know, I often say I have three guiding principles for our Navy. First is strengthen our maritime dominance, which is what we've most talked about here today. We've also talked about my third guiding principle, which is strengthening our partnerships with our allies and industry and such. But my second guiding principle is creating a culture of warfighting excellence where everybody treats each other with dignity and respect. It's extremely important because whether you're in a, a marine in a foxhole, on a submarine, or an aircraft, in a sub wherever you may be, the trust that exists between two service members is needed to be combat ready. It really is. It's about trust between individuals and professionals. And when you look at most sailors and marines and soldiers and airmen who swear an oath of office to the Constitution, they're usually under the age of 25. And when they swear that oath, they're willing to sacrifice their lives for their country. We have a we, we have a, an imperative to treat them as the professionals that they actually are, and they should treat each other as professionals. So we have absolutely zero tolerance for sexual harassment, assault, uh, discrimination of any kind against anyone, uh, or extremism for that matter as well too. It's critical to our nation's combat readiness, and that's the culture that we try to live by. So when it comes to sexual harassment, you know, you gotta get to the basics, you know. When you listen to an improper joke or something about someone else and you don't do something about it, you've now set the same standard by which we're gonna live, we're gonna move forward. That's not the right thing to do. So I need every sailor, every Marine, every civilian in the Department of the Navy to do their part and fight sexual harassment and all the other things that I mentioned every single day. Okay. How do you see suicide within the fleet affecting the Navy's readiness and what is being done to combat this? Yeah, look, suicide is a national crisis. So we're, we're experiencing across the nation. It really is, and it's, it's very complicated, as you know. There are many reasons for it. Uh, in some cases, it might be the stress of serving in the military, but more often than not, actually, it's relationships that are the failure of relationships. It's being discovered sometimes doing things that you might not be, uh, you, you, you shouldn't be doing, obviously, and then under this social media bubble, it just, you know, everybody finds out about it, and there's many complex reasons why um, people commit suicide when the hope is that they wouldn't commit suicide. We have to give them a sense of hope, a sense of family, that they belong, that despite your biggest challenge that you might have out there, that your shipmate, whether it be a Marine or a sailor, is going to be there for you in your time of need, that the institution is going to be there for you in a time of need. And so that's the word that we're trying to get out, trying to educate, trying to provide professional military education as well too, to our enlisted corps, to our officers, so that everybody can work together as one Navy family to try to get beyond the challenge that we're currently facing with this generation of suicides that, we've, that our entire nation is experiencing. And I'll add one other thing too. It's not gonna be easy for the Department of Defense or the Department of the Navy to just go out and seek additional mental, uh, mental health professionals out in the private sector because they're not there either. So we've gotta train more of our own. And the good news is that there's a lot of people who want to join the Department of the Navy and become a corpsman, for example. Let's train those folks as mental health professionals as well. And let's grow our own numbers so that we can provide more support, we can provide more chaplains on ships, and do all the things that's necessary to, to, to responsibly address this very, very challenging issue for all of us. Okay, thank you. Uh, your predecessor, Secretary Ray Mavis, was a strong proponent of seeking green energy solutions for the fleet. What new fuels are realistic, and should the Navy place more emphasis on ships with nuclear power? Well, uh, let me answer the, the third part of that question. Nuclear power has its advantages when it comes to submarines and it comes to aircraft carriers, but we're not at the point where we're going to be putting small nuclear um, 
reactors on small ships and things like that. It's too expensive, too complicated for, for many, many different reasons. Uh, we have made major investments in, in biofuels. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten it to the price point where there's a real return on investment for the American people. So that's something that we have to continue to invest in. But there's been a host of other technologies that the Navy has been investing in to try to actually seek more return on investment on the operational side of the of the energy equation, basically, whether it's just a stern flap on a destroyer that saves a lot of fuel, or whether it's how we act, operate the ships at sea, for example. And so we are making a lot of progress in, in those areas as well, too. Okay. Tell us if about- If I could add oh, one more thing, I'm sorry. Ahead, I, I want to highlight also on the Marine Corps side, you know, Marine Corps Base Albany is one of the first, it's the first base, actually, that has come completely off the grid now. And so we're providing energy to the community as well, too. And that's a, a result of investments that have been made over several years now, actually, to make that happen. So we're moving in the right directions, but there's still more S&T effort that has to go into investments into biofuels before it can, the investment is really worth it. Okay. Uh, excellent to hear. Uh, tell us about your decision to rename the Naval Academy's Moray Hall after former President Jimmy Carter. How did you arrive at that decision? Sure. Uh, I couldn't think of anyone better, quite frankly, to um, personify the ideals of, of, of service to the nation than President Carter. And so when the requirement came to actually change the name of Maury Hall, um, I thought it was the perfect individual to actually honor. Uh, the building was our engineering building at Annapolis uh, for many, many years until Hopper Hall came along and then we moved the engineering sciences over to Hopper Hall and it's now become the humanities building. So who better than and President Carter, who started his career off as an engineer uh, with tremendous success uh, and a very unique relationship with, with Hyman Rickover, and then later on went on to be serve as president, and his life after president became the penultimate humanitarian, you might argue. Okay. Uh, Chinese have built their influence and agency in Sri Lanka and now are in the process of converting civil operations uh, like ports port acquisitions for 99 years to military use um, in a variety of places. What is your assessment in this strategic acquisitions, um, what is your assessment in this strategic acquisitions in important island littorals in the Indian Ocean? Do you see a delay or a limitation in U.S. strategy? It's a real challenge. It's one that we have to continue to monitor very, very closely that we need to try to counter to make sure that we ourselves gain access to bases uh, both throughout Asia and Central and South America in Africa and everywhere else as well too. You know, the Chinese go around very quietly buying up properties, buying up companies, for example, on both ends of the Panama Canal. We've got to keep track of all those things and we've got to be able to counter and deter it. And we've got to make sure that our partners and allies understand the consequences of some of those investments as well too, because they don't always prove out the way that the host nation thinks that they prove out. A lot of countries are discovering that, you know, you come in and with a satchel full of money basically and now they own the port and and you can't pay the debt, and now the port falls to the Chinese, and they've lost the very sovereignty of their own country. So we're trying to work with our allies and partners to provide the best uh, you know, counter options uh, to our nations so that we can continue to support them in a real, real way. That's what real friends do for each other, real countries that care about each other. Uh, they're transparent, and they're there at the worst times, not just during the good times. Um, this is a little bit difficult to read, but what is the Navy doing about increased Chinese presence in the South China Sea? Um, and how prepared is the U.S. Navy for Chinese threats against Taiwan? I think we're, uh, with regards to what we're doing with regards to the, the increased presence in the, in the South China Sea, again, it goes back to working with our allies and partners. We've just uh, um, announced, for example, that the Philippines is allowing us greater access to for their bases in the Philippines working with more Marines and sailors in the Philippines and with um, uh, in Singapore as well too and other countries throughout the uh, Pacific region to, to build more interoperability and more interexchangeability wherever possible. Um, but we watch all of that very carefully. Okay. Uh, how can the U.S. Navy support the delivery of larger seagoing platforms through the Turkish Straits to support the Ukrainian Navy operating in the Black Sea? I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more yes. time? How can the U.S. Navy support the delivery of larger seagoing platforms through the Turkish Straits to support the Ukrainian Navy operating in the Black Sea? So we, we do support the Ukrainian Navy. We support the Ukrainian Armed Forces in ways that I won't go into a great amount of detail on. Um, however, as, with regards to the Straits, I think that's a diplomatic solution that's 
uh, that's been carefully crafted. Uh, it's a very important uh, approach, I think, that we're taking to make sure that we don't escalate matters beyond where they currently are. Uh, I will tell you otherwise, though, that there's probably nothing that the United States Navy can't do from the Eastern Med that it would have to do inside the Black Sea as well. Um, and so we are better positioned in the Eastern Med where we currently are. Okay. And less vulnerable. Okay. Uh, is the Navy looking to expand its presence in the Middle East? In the Middle East, I'm really excited by the work that's going on in the Fifth Fleet with Task Force 59 and the work that Admiral Cooper is doing as our Fifth Fleet Commander. Um, we have at any one given time over 100 air, surface, and subsurface drones operating to try to maintain increased situational awareness um, in the agency and other places throughout the Middle East, for example. And it's made a real impact, for example, as we've been able to more successfully deter uh, illegal shipments that have been coming from Iran, for example, going to Yemen and other places where they support terrorism throughout the world. And so it's that kind of model, basically, which is far more cheaper than having 100 man vessels out there. Um, that I think will prove more, even more effective in the future. And I think it's a model also that can prove very effective in Central and South America and Fourth Fleet, for example, as we look at the illegal fishing challenge. Um, China with its you know, 200 to 300 to 400 illegal, illegal uh, fishing vessels that often prey you know, off of Ecuador and the Galapagos Islands, eating the fish stocks off the Galapagos Islands, which is a, a real threat to that echo center. You know, I think that there are things that we can do with unmanned technology to provide the queuing necessary for countries who may not have a lot of the resources to then be able to better queue the, re the, the, the planes and the ships that they do have to counterdict whether it's an illegal fisherman or whether it's uh, a drug runner. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, the, I'm going to ask about a region we haven't really talked about. You know, I'm talking like a New Yorker, so I'm trying to keep <laughs> up with you, you know? You're, you're doing great. You're like a machine. Uh, the U.S. Navy used to operate with all the navies of Latin America. Uh, do you think the possibility to return to those days? Well, we, a we actually are in many ways. Uh, our engagement actually is even more substantive in many ways. We still have our ongoing annual UNITAS exercise. I myself went down to Brazil uh, and participated in the UNITAS exercise that went on for several weeks, actually, and we have that upcoming again. Colombia is leading the effort uh, in 2023. And so we have continuous engagement in the submarine domain. We have con with their diesel submarines, for example. We hold conferences in, in the United States. Southcom uh, herself has been very, very active in engaging along with our Fourth Fleet Commander, Admiral Aiken, uh, with uh, the navies and, and the Marine Corps of, of South America, American countries as well, too, to remain engaged in every possible way, again, trying to build this this combined interoperability that's so essential to us working together to perform our mission. Okay. Um, can you speak about ethical constraints on, on artificial intelligence, keeping the human components in autonomous systems? <laughs> wow, yeah, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think every any time that you embrace a, a new technology of this nature, uh, there has to be a set of laws and ethical regulations that go along with that so that we understand not just the primary consequences of the utilization of that technology, but the secondary consequences, which sometimes can be less known and perhaps even more dangerous, right? So I think it's important for you know our communities, respective lawyers, for example, and technologists who truly understand what the little black box actually does, right? Well, what's in that little AI, AI black box and how it could be used and should it be used in accordance with uh, the laws of our nations and international laws so that we don't violate that in the future as well. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask one last question and we'll go to our closing. Uh, could US aircraft carriers survive an all out war? Uh, could, well, there's a lot of different components to that question, obviously. You know, in World War II, you know, regretfully, we lost uh, 12 aircraft carriers. Um, inherently, war is a dangerous environment, and it's not just, you know, aircraft carriers. We try to do our best to ensure that we operate our submarines, our ships, our aircraft carriers, our aircraft, our marine forces in a way that's going to provide the maximum protection and defensive measures so that we can deter the enemy from doing what it wants to do. Uh, regretfully, we live in a world where just about everything operates in the, inside the weapon engagement zone. 
And so the importance of de defensive uh, systems on these platforms is incredibly important. So if you take a look at some of the laser technologies that we're developing, for example, and we're experimenting with right now on our Arleigh Burke class type destroyers, um, we're doing really well with them. But at some point as those grow larger, we're gonna need bigger platforms because of the power requirements associated with them as well too. So there's a lot of things that go into answering, being able to effectively answer that question. And we're constantly looking at uh, the defense of all of our platforms and all our sailors and all our Marines so that they can do their jobs most effectively. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could keep the Chinese fleet from ever even getting underway from the pier with the use of cyber or space technology, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, before I ask the final question, let me take a moment to thank the organizers of today's events. Uh, headliners co-team leaders Donna Lyon Leger and Lori Russo. Today's headliner event coordinator Kevin Wensing is over there. Yeah. Club events coordinator Cecily Scott Martin, club membership director Kate Helster, and club executive director Bill McCarran. It's also my honor, sir, to present you with the most coveted National Press Club Very mug. Nice for being in the hot seat with us. <laughs> Enjoy. Let me also remind our audience uh, of our upcoming headliners luncheon. On March 14th, we invite you to join us for the luncheon with the U.S. Marine Corps Commandant, General David H. Berger, who will address the Marine Corps' mission focus post-Afghanistan. And now for the last question, which is... Top Gun Maverick had been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture. Did that film and others such as Tom Hanks' film Greyhound help recruiting? And which actor would you pick to portray you in a Navy blockbuster? Wow. <laughs> you know, I had the, the good fortune, actually, of, of spending uh, a full day with, uh, with uh, Tom Cruise, actually. And he was extraordinary okay. engaging with our sailors and Marines and um, where the film was shown in San Diego. And, uh, but boy, to your question, I'm not sure I've ever given much thought to that. I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe a Tom Selleck or, I don't know. All right. Danny DeVito, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I'll let you choose which one. I'm sure we could make either one work with the United States Navy. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. to gavel out. <laughs> One thing I never picked up on is the formality of the gavel. <laughs>